good morning to you. So good to see you. If you're glad to be here today, say amen. If you know where you are today, say amen. That always helps, right? Kind of knowing where we are and just excited for the wonderful day in the house of the Lord. Anytime the church body meets together on this earth and in heaven, congregational singing will be in our midst. One day, we will lift our voice before the throne of grace. We will sing with angelic pitch. I'm looking forward to that day myself. Wonderfully, when I won't be afraid to sing out loud and all will hear. But this morning, we will begin singing the wondrous story. No greater story than to sing of the Christ who died for us. Stand if you would. Sing it with all your heart. I trust it will prepare you for our worship service. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. How we left his throne in glory for the cross of Calvary. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory Gathered by the crystal sea I was lost, but Jesus found me From the ship that went astray Threw his loving arms around me Drew me back into his way Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story Of the Christ who died for me Sing it with the saints in glory Gathered by the crystal sea Days of darkness still come o'er me Sorrow's path I often tread But the Savior still is with me By His hand I'm safely led Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story Of the Christ who died for me Sing it with the saints in glory Gathered by the crystal sea He will keep me till the river Rolls its waters at my feet Then he'll bear me safely over Where the loved one I shall meet Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story Of the Christ who died for me Sing it with the saints in glory Gathered by the crystal sea Amen. Good morning. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father God, oh, what a, so, what a good feeling it is just to be in your house today. Lord, the hymn writer had it so right. When we were lost, you found us. And when you found us, you wrapped your arms around us with love. Lord, thank you for just pouring your unconditional love onto us. Thank you for loving us, even though we don't deserve it, but you continue to love us with your whole entire hearts. Lord, I pray today be a wonderful service, Lord. Lord, I pray that you fill Pastor Hunter with the, with the spirit, Lord, to just stand still and preach the word with authority. Lord, if there's anyone that's here today for the first time that have never heard the gospel, Lord, Lord, I pray today be the day they open their heart and come forth and humble themselves to you. Be with us now as we gather as a body to worship and praise you for everything you're doing. We love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. At this time, I turn around and welcome your neighbor. As you come back, remain standing. I love this little chorus. I could sing it every day, every service. We stand corporately together in all of him. One day we will stand in his presence. Oh, the God to whom all praise is due. Lift your voice now and stand in awe. Yeah. 
ocean Like nothing ever seen or heard Who can grasp your infinite wisdom Who can fathom the depth of your love You are beautiful beyond description Majesty and throne above And I stand, I stand in awe of you I stand, I stand in awe of you Holy God to whom all praise is due I stand in awe of you You are beautiful you are beautiful beyond description To marvelous for words To wonderful for comprehension Like nothing ever seen or heard Who can grasp your infinite wisdom Who can fathom the depth of your love You are beautiful beyond description Majesty enthroned above And I stand, I stand in awe of you I stand, I stand in awe of you Holy God to whom all praise is due I stand in awe of you Amen Be seated if you would I love that little chorus And look forward to the day that we will stand in his presence What a marvelous and wonderful day that will be So good to see you uh, at 8.30 and 8 in the morning it's getting daylight very early. It's interrupting my sleep. Is anybody else finding that? And uh, you ever not start the day off right? You ever had one of those days you just don't start the day off right? Today was my day. I did not start the day off right. Uh, first off, the dog got up at about 45 minutes before my alarm clock was to go off. That's aggravating because how do you go back to sleep for 30 minutes, right? Then I go back to sleep for 30 minutes, and I'm the type of guy that I set an alarm and then stay up all night worrying if I could wake up two minutes before the alarm. Anybody else have that weird problem? That's you. Alarm goes ringing off. I reach to grab it, and I like to go to bed with a cup of water. And last night, I got me a beautiful cup of ice water and put it on the bed and, or put on in my nightstand, and I was drank a little bit of it, put it, went to grab that alarm, knocked that water all over. I could hear it running down the back of the nightstand. I'm thinking it's going to go on the plug, you know. And then when you do something like that early in the morning, your, your wife is just such an encouragement to you. <laughs> um, I won't say much about that moment, but she wanted to know what was going on. And then I'm there trying to dry it. with. It was just, just not, not a good day. So I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning as far as for the start. If you're visiting with us, thank you for being here. In the pew in front of you, there's a connection card. Please take a moment, fill that out. And then after the service, stop by the welcome desk, exchange that card for a gift. We'd love to greet you face to face. So much going on this week. As you can tell, we are prepared, prepared for Vacation Bible School. Uh, you will see that all throughout the building. And uh, as we have many boys and girls that will be coming tomorrow at 9.30 in the morning for our Destination Dig Vacation Bible School. Vacation Bible School will go Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And uh, please pray. Uh, if you're not involved and able to help us during the day, you can pray during the day. Pray for God's protection, for God's wisdom. Pray for the power of the gospel as it reaches the hearts of boys and girls. Pray for the organization uh, of all of it. And just that it will be a wonderful moment as we take an outreach here into our community and to grow our young people for sure. So uh, because of Vacation Bible School, there will be no Wednesday night Bible study this Wednesday night. 
uh, of course, no kid, Kids for Christ or Youth Department as we will be consumed this week with Vacation Bible School. So thank you for everybody that has been helping there. Uh, today, after the 11 o'clock service, there is a camp meeting for parents that are sending their kids to camp. Uh, Brother Simeon came to my office early this morning and said that we've had so many register that now we're buying airline tickets uh, to fly them into Asheville, North Carolina. So it's a great opportunity here to get the kids up. And we have a lot of new kids. The, the Wilds gives us scholarships that we're allowed to give to kids that may not be saved uh, from the community and so on and so forth. And so we're looking forward to the opportunity there. So if you are a parent and you have sent your kid years and years to camp and you think you know everything there is to know about camp, please at least make the meeting. If you can't make the meeting uh, because of the service, it's after touch base with Brother Simeon today. He, you'll recognize Brother Simeon. He's the guy that looks like he has the joy of the Lord today because he just got off a of vacation. And so he's, he'll, be, he'll be different than everybody else. Um, and, and then all throughout, you see the announcements there. Uh, there there's another wedding. Zara jo Joy Cuddy will be getting married on July 2nd. And then we go right into the month of July and some dates there that you can notice for sure. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your prayers. Uh, choir is out for this summer, and they are resting, and they deserve this rest. This is normally when they would find themselves in our service. Uh, our music will continue as we will sing, oh, I worship you, almighty God, and how great thou art. On the last verse of How Great Thou Art, today is the recognition of our graduates. And I'm going to ask if you graduated high school, college, or postgraduate level, if on the last verse of How Great Thou Art, you would just kind of make your way down front and uh, stand here in front of one of the pews with me. And uh, we want to recognize your accomplishment and your achievement after our hymn. And then we'll have our prayers to the people and looking forward to preaching you today, preaching for you today from the book of Genesis. All right, stand if you would. And let's begin our last congregational moment with two. I worship you, Almighty God, and leading into the great hymn, How Great Thou Art. How great thou art, how great 
to the wars. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. seated if you would please and uh, your singing is just a wonderful blessing every year on grad day uh, the second Sunday of June we take a moment here to honor and recognize the achievements of the folks in our church I think graduation is a wonderful achievement having two services uh, they get a little bit divided the whole row here is filled with gifts of expectation and I think I see three that made it to the 830 service. These are the early birds who get the worm. These will be the ones that will be ultimately successful because they know how to get out of bed early in the morning, right? And, uh, and so we're delighted. Brother Simeon, come, if you would, please, with that microphone. I want to ask our high school graduates, and I think we have two young men that are here that graduated high school. I'm going to ask them if they would come at this time, introduce themselves, tell them, you know, the church where you graduated from, and what your plans are uh, moving forward. If you don't know your plans moving forward, then just tell them you're going to trust the Lord and do what your mother tells you to do. That, that will be fine. Just hold your applause until both of them, and we'll let uh, Malik go first. Good evening, everyone. Oh. This is loud. All right. My name is Malik Dunstan, and I've been attending Plantation Baptist Church for a while, and I'm graduating. Ooh, sorry. And I'm going into McFadder so I can get my general contractor's license. So. Good morning, everyone. My name is Leon Yachter. I graduated from Plantation Baptist Christian School, and I will be attending Pensacola Christian College to study business. All right, these are two fine young men. I'm excited for them. And uh, both of them gave a speech at graduation here, if you were here. And Malik had his so well practiced that he even said good evening this morning. And that's wonderful. We give the, uh, the graduates um, a gift, a Bible at this time. And uh, we'll give them one in just a second, Brother Simeon. I'll ask the only college graduate if she would come at this time. You may notice a family resemblance here. This one is very special. She belongs to me, and uh, she has graduated, and she has plans, and oh, does she have plans. So I'll let her tell you about them. <laughs> Good morning. Um, my name is Casey Hunter, and I just graduated from Pensacola Christian College with a bachelor's in marketing, and I'm currently working in property management in Fort Lauderdale, and I'm getting married in November. Back on, and she will forever still love her daddy, or she'll be in trouble. All right, we're very proud of these young people, and I want to have a prayer of dedication for them, and then as they leave the platform, see Brother Simeon, and he'll give you your gift, and uh, pray for them. They, they want to do what God has for them to do, and we're very proud of them and excited for the future going forward. All right, pray with me if you would, please. Heavenly Father God, it's a joy to be able to stand on the platform today and recognize achievement, recognize um, accomplishment, success, especially to recognize it in the youth of our nation and to recognize it in the youth of our church. Um, 
the older I get, Lord, the more I pastor, the more I realize the investment needed in the generations to follow. And I thank you for what you're doing here inside of this ministry. All the way, Lord, as we take a vacation Bible school for the children and move into the youth department, then you recognize that they begin to graduate and they begin to go forward. And my prayer for these three in this moment is that they would remember their creator in the days of their youth. My prayer for them is that the, the foundation of the authority of the word of God, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the conviction that they have developed within their own heart as to thus saith the Lord, things like in the beginning, God, things like all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verses like the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Verses like faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Verses like I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Or just the reality and the conviction and the truth of your holy word. And as it finds and has found lodging in these three hearts, that they would realize that this is a platform that they can build their life on. And Lord, whatever they do, whether it's learning a trade, whether it's learning business and development, whether it's working in the properties and the managements of, of corporate world, may they realize first that they are a child of the living God and that they belong to the church of Jesus Christ. And may they not only work in this world, but may they serve their God through their church. And Lord, I think about Casey getting married and serving as uh, in tandem with her husband. I think about Malik and Leon. Lord, I pray that you would provide direction and guidance and you have a wife for them and a future for them. And, and Lord, I'm just excited to see how that all will unfold. I want them to remember something, Lord. I want them to remember that their church loves them and their church is proud of them and their church is here for them and their church will always keep them before the throne of grace. And when they think about Plantation Baptist Church, wherever they will be in the world one day, may just that wonderful, warm feeling of home just grip their heart and their mind. Lord, behind them is our moms and dads, grandmas, grandpas, teachers, leaders, youth workers, much investment has gone on into their life. And we are looking for a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful return for the glory of God. I pray you bless our service. I pray you'd help me to preach with power and authority. And I trust God as the word of God goes out that it will build faith in our hearts. We love you. Thank you for loving us first. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. All right. God bless you. Give them one more hand. They can be seated if they would, please. I'll ask our men if they will come and get ready for our offering at this time. We have a trio that will be singing on the, sub, on the song entitled The Great Divide, speaking of what Christ has bridged for us. And I'm excited to let this begin to do a work in our hearts. And then I want to come and preach you a message entitled In the Beginning, Elohim. God bless you as you lift your voice. God bless you as you give.
I was thinking the whole time they were singing about that in Luke chapter 16 where the Lord Jesus quotes, there's a great gulf fixed between me and thee. I'm glad and for sure that that gulf has been bridged by the Lord Jesus Christ. Take your Bible, if you would, please. Go back to page number one. We were there last week. We will be there again this week. Genesis chapter one, verse number one will be our text this morning. If you have something that you could put in Hebrews chapter 11, we will very quickly and very briefly make our way there. I wanted to welcome our missionaries with us. Not often do we get to have designers with us today, and we get both of them uh, with us this morning. Uh, Pray for uh, Brother Steve. He will be traveling to Africa um, on Thursday or tomorrow. And speaking over there in conference and teaching classes. And so he will need traveling mercies as he goes there. They are like the rest of the north. Once one child moves to Florida, pretty soon everybody will move to Florida, right? They're not moving. They're still in Ohio, but that's what happened to me. I moved down to Florida and my whole, to get away from my family. And they all <laughs> followed me down. I was looking to see if my mother-in-law was here. She's not in this service, but I'm sure she's listening online, and I will hear about that in about 30 seconds. And so take your Bible, if you would, please. We did this last week. Let's do it again. Let's read it out loud. Verse number one. Here we go. One, two, three. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. One more time. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. How the world got so messed up. This is the title of our series that we find ourselves beginning. Um, In preaching this series and thinking about this almost constantly, I'm very in tuned to every time I hear somebody say messed up. And so as I've been making my way throughout the week and listening on television or listening in conversation or um, just being around people, you would be shocked how often, if you'll listen attentively, you hear somebody say things like, that's messed up, that's messed up. Uh, it does not take a rocket science, a rocket uh, scientist to understand that our, our world is in trouble Um, Whether you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ or not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, things that happen in our world often are messed up. They don't make sense. They, They go beyond reality. They would go beyond compassion. They would go beyond kindness. 
Many times they can get into uh, not just a ridiculous position, but an evil position as we think about what is going on in the world. And so God laid on my heart a series to kind of help us with perspective about where we are in the world at this moment and this time. And I think if you're going to have a biblical worldview and a proper world perspective, one that brings about peace, one that enables you to know joy even though you lived in a messed up world, one that enables you to function freely and function um, with, with uh, a tenderness to you, I think you must understand how the world began. And so last week, we, we preached an introductory message about that subject from the book of Genesis, the book of origin. And we talked about how that everything we deal with in life from physical creation um, all the way through organization of life, whether it comes to how life came into the world, how life is gendered by the world, how government came into the world, how evil has come into the world. Really and truthfully, you can go back to the book of Genesis and you can find the origin of God's intent to much that goes on into our world. Now, it looks vastly vastly different than when God stepped back and said after he created the world that everything was good, right? I would say government looks vastly different than when Noah got off the ark and God established human government in Genesis chapter number six. And so much of, uh, much of what we, we find in our world today is we, we were able to track the origin of that from the book of Genesis. And so I, I want to preach to you today a message that is entitled, In the Beginning, God. And I want to take you back to verse number one, and I need you to understand what happened in verse number one. Now, this is not just a, a lecture. This is not just an information message. I will need to lay a groundwork a little bit here, but I promise you in the conclusion of this, we will deal with the refutation of the world's philosophies, and I will bring them right into your lap, and you will begin to hear things that the world celebrates. They make movies about it. They sing about it. They want to be described as it, and I think you will be able to find that all of that is refuted as to being deceitful, dishonest, and a lie from Genesis chapter 1, verse number 1. As you come to this verse, in the opening verse, the words you know, it's uh, probably the most foundational verse in the scripture is Genesis chapter 1, verse number 1. I do believe it's probably one of the most widely read verses as people start reading the Bible in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 1. I would submit to you that if you can believe Genesis 1, 1, you can believe the rest of the Bible, okay? Pastor, if I can believe Genesis 1, 1, why would you say if I can believe Genesis 1-1. Is Genesis 1-1 hard to believe? No, none of the Bible is hard to believe, but all of the Bible demands something for you to be able to believe it. Now you need Hebrews chapter 11, please, if you would. Hebrews chapter 11, look, if you would, at verse number 3. The Bible says, through, what's that word, class? Faith. Through faith, we, what's that word? Okay. So not by intellect, not by proof, not by scholarship, not even by evidence. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. 
so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. The definition of faith is found in verse number one. Please look at it. Now, faith is the substance. It's substantial of things hoped for. It is the, what class? Evidence of things not seen. So faith, believing God, believing his word, trusting him, is not something that is foolish. It's not something that is mysterious. Faith is substantial. Faith is evidential. The book of Romans teaches us that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Pastor Hunter said to you, if you can believe Genesis chapter 1, verse number 1, then you can believe the rest of the Bible. Because all of the Bible is to be, be believed by faith. This is where many people with their intellect and many people with their rationale and many people in their pride choose not to believe the word of God. By the way, I, will, I can support from the word of God that belief is always a choice. That choice is always proven as to what you believe by how you behave. If we believed that the building was on fire, we would exit the building. So if I believed that God created the heaven and the earth, then I would bow down and worship him. I made a statement last week. I want to make it again. This is the true and living word of God. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Every other book must bow down to this book. Every other philosophy must bow down to this book. And the Bible teaches in the book of Philippians that one day every knee will bow to the word to the Lord Jesus, to the God of this book. What you hold in your hand is not just an ordinary, not run-of-the-mill book. You hold in your hand the eternal living word of God. Wow. Wow. Fascinating. Notice, if you would, please, in Genesis chapter 1, Verse number one, as the Bible opens up, it opens up with a declaration of the eternal God. It opens up with the declaration of the eternal God in the creation of the physical universe. In the beginning, God. I need that to just ring in your mind, in your mind, in the beginning, God. The word that is translated God there in the Hebrew is the word Elohim. It's used 2,500 times. It's all throughout the passage of the scripture. The word Elohim is a word that deals with majesty and omnipotence. When you think about majesty, you think of regality. You think of kingship. You think of the supreme authority that there is. When you think of omnipotence, you know that is almighty power, the highest that there is. The word in Hebrew is a plural word with a singular direction. It's a uni-plural noun. The word Elohim or God is a plural of majesty with a singular verb. In the beginning, Elohim. In the beginning, God. Now we know that there is one God. Three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So we know that God is one, yet more in his oneness are the three persons of the Godhead. Notice, no attempt from the word of God 
to prove that God exists. Just the opening phrase of declaration, in the beginning, God. Pastor, how old is God? Just think about that. Let your mind think about that. How old is God? He's eternal. You want one that actually will hurt you? When did God begin? When, when did God originate? Think about this. He's always been. I began nine months from February 12th, 1973. I don't know when that was. You had a beginning. God had no beginning. He has no end. Before there was anything, there is God. Pastor, that, that just can't be. There has to be a beginning to everything. That proves that you were created. If you think that, it proves that you're not God. And it proves that we are sinners that deserve to go to hell. See... You're not infinite. You're not limitless. Your brain works in a way that God created it. And so God created you with a beginning. Therefore, you must find footing and foundation at the beginning. God has no beginning. We do. Now, if you can honestly get an assessment of that, it would make you want to do everything God says because God created you and you're not God. No attempt to prove God. It's just the declaration that He is. It's interesting. Majesty and omnipotence. In the beginning, God. What did God do in the beginning? Verse number one, God created. In the beginning, God created. I need you to understand this word created. This word created, as translated from the Hebrew, speaks of a work that only God can do. Nobody can create, according to this word, other than God. When we talk about the creator, we are talking about something that only God can do. Let's be very clear that we understand. In the beginning, God He called into existence that which had no existence. Like, like there was nothing. And out of nothing, he created. How arrogant. Mankind has become because we think we can create like God created. We say foolish things like, we can, well, i got to create some time. How arrogant. Look what I created. No, you made and you formed. 
but you didn't create. What is the difference between God's creation and then his forming and man's making and forming? I would submit to you that the difference is he's God and we're not. People, there was nothing and from nothing he created the world. We think we can make and form, but all we do is we make and we form with materials that are already in existence. See, if you didn't have dirt, you couldn't build the skyscrapers of the world. If you didn't have a brain, you couldn't build your business. How arrogant is it for humanity to think that we have the same creating ability as God? Understand, the work of making and forming consists of organizing already existing materials and making them more complex. In Genesis chapter 1, verse number 1, God spoke into existing something that had no material or no previous existence. Just God spoke it into existence. Amazing how this works. You could read it this way. The transcendent, omnipotent God called into existence the universe. Pastor, why are you harping on all of this? Because if we really believe this, A, we would come to Jesus Christ to be saved. And I think we would stand in awe of God. So we brought problems into the room today. We brought needs into the room today. We brought difficulties into the room today. And you're worried about if God could pay this little bill or you're worried about if God could fix this little problem or you're worried about if God could touch you physically. He called into existence from nothing the universe. He can take care of us. Wow. Notice what he created. Heaven. Earth, heaven, the word there is not the heavens like the stars of heaven. They were made on day number four. It was not the planets or the galaxies. They were made on day number four. On day number one, God in the beginning created the heaven. The word there is space. Now, before you think about space and you begin to see galaxies and stars and the Milky Way and all of that, no, 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 no. Those came on day number four. We're talking about outer space. We're talking about space. God created out of nothing space. I know Elon Musk wants to take you to space. (laughs) Enjoy the ride. He couldn't do it if God didn't create it. Earth. The word there is the word matter. Space. Matter. This is interesting. The creation of the basic elements of matter were structured and organized into the earth. We need to create a little space here. No, the only reason you can create space is because God's already created space. You can form yourself around space. You can operate in space. Praise God he created personal space. Some of you need to believe in that a little bit more. Sorry. But then he created matter. Material, things we could shape. 
things we could form. Look what I created. No. You structured it. You formed it. But let God strip away the matter and let me see you make something out of nothing. In the beginning. So a universe is really a continuum of space, matter, and in the beginning, the beginning is time. So before you ever had day and night, before you ever had any of the other creation, in the beginning, God created space, matter, and time. Pastor, why the pace so slow? And why are you harping on all of this? The pace is so slow, and I'm harping on all of this because the Bible says this. The earth is the Lord's. The fullness thereof and the people that dwell therein. Now, I would submit to you that the earth and the fullness and the people that dwell therein are, rebell are in a position of rebellion against the God who created them. The peoples of the earth act like they're God. The peoples of the earth think because they can form and make that they're godlike. Well, there's no reason to have two gods. If I'm God, then I don't need the God of heaven. I'll just be God myself. Genesis chapter 1, verse number 1. If you can believe that, refutes all of the philosophies of humanity. So let's name a couple of them, right? The Bible says in Psalm 14, verse number one, the fool has said in his heart, no God. Today we call people that do not believe in God or deny the existence of God, we call them atheists. Do you want to know why the world is so messed up? Because atheism is growing. Because people choose to deny there is a God and that they're going to believe in God. And they therefore choosing to deny that there is a God, they become a God unto themselves. Read the book of Judges. You think we're messed up? Israel was messed up. And the description of them in the book of Judges was an atheistic description. And every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And this is really and truthfully why our world is so messed up. Our world is so messed up because we do not believe that God created the world. We do not believe that God is therefore the, the owner of this world. And we have philosophies that have adopted into the heart and mind of humanity that we've given titles to. And atheism is a philosophy that says there is no God. I submit to you, according to Genesis 1.1, there is a God, and he is eternal, and he created all that there is. Okay? So if you don't believe that there's a God, why would you need Jesus? Of course he's nothing more than a curse word. Of course he's nothing more than anything. Let's talk about pantheism. Pantheism, pastor. Pantheism. What's pantheism? How is that relative to my life? Are you pansexual? Anybody heard the term pansexual? If you're a parent and you haven't heard of this, you're so far behind the eight ball with your teenager, you don't understand life. 
Matter of fact, they're past it now. Pantheism. Pantheism is the belief that the universe is God. Now, Hollywood preaches this tremendously. Influencers are teaching your children this online. There is no God. The universe is God. So, so a, a pantheist would, would, would say that God is substance and force and the laws of the universe that just appeared without creation. That trees are God. Everything is a God. So from pantheism, you get things like pansexuality, which says, I don't care what the biological sex is or the gender is or what the identity is. I'll sleep with anything. I'm pansexual. So if I find you inwardly attractive to me, then it doesn't matter if you're a boy or a girl. It doesn't matter if you're a girl who calls yourself a boy or a boy who calls yourself a girl. I'm in. And the fact that I'm in is my way to worship God because the universe is God. Now, I would say that's a damnable lie because Genesis chapter 1 will tell you that God is transcendent to the universe. God is not the universe. God made the universe. Okay? So you can worship a universe all you want, from pantheism all the way down to here. But understand, in the beginning, God made space, matter, and time, the continuum of a universe with laws and direction. He's the eternal God. Let's talk about polytheism. Poly, the belief in more than one God. This is running rampant in our community and in our society. Well, there can't just be one God. That's your God, but I, I believe in a different God. The sun is my God. The moon is my God. You know, the universe is filled with gods. A polytheistic viewpoint of God allows one to create his own God or her own God. It allows that God to have God-like ability in their life. And so, of course, if you believe there are many gods, you would not want the true God. Why in the world would anybody who believes there's many gods want the true God? Because the true God looks at you and says you're a sinner who's on their way to hell. Who needs to be redeemed. You're not perfect. You're not righteous. You're in iniquity. Now, I love you, and I sent my son to die for you, my son to redeem you, and you can be saved. But if, if you believe in polytheism, the last God you would ever want is Jesus Christ. You would want a God that makes you feel right in your sexuality, makes you feel right in your pride, makes you feel right in your opinion, makes you feel right in your person, makes you feel good, makes you feel blessed, enables you to navigate your lust with the spirit world. I mean, why would you ever want a God who would put a standard of righteousness or morality upon you? I am God. I was scrolling, doing some research, and came across the song. I know nothing about the author. I know nothing about, I know I watched five seconds of the video, and it was satanic. But a woman was singing a song entitled, I'm not a woman, I am a God. I bet your kid knows. 
Guarantee you, your kid knows. Let's talk about materialism. Nothing exists except matter. There's no spiritual life. All that is, is, is godly or worshipful is what I can tangibly touch. Therefore, I, like the rich man, live my life to gain money, wealth, material. I live for materialistic things. Now, never giving any thought to my spiritual life that I'm a sinner that needs to be saved, that I got to stand before a holy and righteous God. My God is on this earth. My God is the matter of this earth. He who dies with the most toys wins. People live like this. The reality is, matter had a beginning. It's not God. If I had a dollar bill, I would raise it up and tell you it was created. It's not a God. Dualism. What is dualism? It's just exactly what it says. If you have dual, you have two, right? So dualism says two supreme opposed powers uh, of, or gods or set of divine or demoniac beings that cause the world to exist. This is where you have the good versus evil. This is dualism. This is Buddhism. You go to the temples of Buddha and they'll have ones for the good gods. They'll have one for the evil gods. This is how people submit this. I want you to hear something you need to hear. There's no evil God that's on the same playing field as the true and living God. There's not like God who is good and then God who is evil. Satan is not a God. Now, he's the God of this world. But he was created just like you. There's not a good God and an evil God. So from there, well, if I do good, I'll get to heaven. As long as I don't do enough bad. Philosophies? Let's talk about humanism. Humanism, that which values the goodness of human beings. Humans are the starting point of morality. So however you feel is right. So hence, if I feel I'm not a man, then I'm right. If I feel like I want to kill you today, then that's just how I feel. If I feel like I want to do this today, then, then my morality is the standard of my righteousness equal to this book. I promise you there's no human behavior that is equal to the righteousness of God. Man is not getting better. Man is not developing into some type of God. Man needs the true and living God. Humanism denies the afterlife. Humanism means is giving their own life meaning by seeking happiness only in this life. So when happiness is over, or when we can't find the humanist, find happiness, we try to just find an alternate state of highness. Let me let me just make sure we understand something. It's one thing for medical purposes, but it's a sin to do illicit drugs. Tell me you believe that as a Christian. It is so eternally dangerous to take on a high do you know that in the Bible, the word drugs is translated witchcraft? Pharmakia? Don't raise your hand on this. Have you been high? I meet people that blow my mind that have been high. Yeah, it just, it just, it just, 
I just need an escape, Pastor. It just feels good. Okay. But understand, you're opening up yourself to the spiritist world, and it's real. And so our youth who are being taught humanism in the, in the school system, that their morality is the beginning of their righteousness, their truth is truth, their feeling is right, even if it goes against God. The promise that this life will make you happy? Are you kidding me? So no wonder they're trying drugs earlier and earlier and earlier. And now they're dying, dying, dying. Humanism. Let me just stop right here and just say something. This is why we have Plantation Baptist Christian School. It's not a perfect school, but we teach our kids the God of this book. One more. Evolutionism. Humanism is wrong because God's not, God, not man, is the ultimate reality. Evolution denies God as creator. Are you an evolutionist? So if I ask you, how did the world begin, what would you just, in your heart and your mind, how would you begin that process? Well, Pastor, nobody really knows. Uh, there's a really special Greek word for that, baloney. <laughs> I know. Because the Bible tells me so. Well, you know, Pastor, I'm not an evolutionist the way that, 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 that you might think. But, but couldn't God use evolution no, absolutely, vehemently, confidently, no. Well, God can do anything. No, he can't. He can't break this word. And he said he created everything in six days. And biblically... You can take the generations in the Bible and they will support a young earth. So anytime you hear somebody like a pastor who says, oh no, there's like this huge time gap between verse 1, 2, and so on. You know that they're trying to fit in an evolutionary theory into a Bible theory because we're, we've become as a people afraid just to stand up and tell somebody you're wrong the Bible says it differently let's go back we're done if you can believe in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth by faith then you can believe the whole Bible Parents, I submit to you atheism, pantheism, polytheism, materialism, dualism, humanism, and evolutionism is everywhere in your kid's life. Everywhere. And you better be able to take this book and defend those. Grandparents, do something for me. Get your grandkid and just ask them simple questions. Hey, what do you think about the beginning of the world? Hey, do you, do you think who made you? Just ask them questions. Who made you? Hey, do you, do you think God is real? Hey, let me ask you a question. How many gods do you think there really are? 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and parent, grandparents, let me just remind you, you raise those mothers and fathers. Huh? Yeah. Before you think your kids are doing a bad job, that was your job. You raised the kids that are parenting your grandkid. You did it. We love the book, don't we? I'm telling you, the world is messed up because it simply denies in the beginning God. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, when there was nothing You spoke it into existence out of nothing. Time, space, matter. From there you went on to form and shape and create. But in the beginning, God. Wow. We've come a long way in our world, Lord, to the denial of that. Now we, we, we worship that there is no God. That everything is a God. That there's more than one God. That material is a God. No, there's only two gods. There's a good God and there's an evil God. Oh, no, no, no. I'm a God. Well, no, really there's no, there's no God and we just, we just all de- just developed. We just came from nowhere. All of these philosophies are governing the belief system of the world. And what you believe determines your behavior. No wonder the world's messed up. And yet... For God so loved the world. You love the peoples of the world. You want to redeem them, save them, minister to them. You're such a great God. Father, my prayer is that in this series, God's people would know that the Bible is right and I'm on the side of the Bible. That God's people would be able to take the Bible and defend against the philosophies of the world. And that God's people would realize that we're in a battle for truth in our homes and our children. That we would engage in this battle with the sword of the Spirit and with the Word of God. Lord, there might be somebody here today and they've never accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior ever. They've come face to face today that before there was anything, there was God, which demands from them their submission, which demands for them their heart. All of these other gods were either from the mind of Satan or created from the mind of man, but they're not true gods. There's only one true and living God. Christians. We need to engage. We need to make sure that our feet are planted on the foundation of the word of God. Grandparents need to check on their grandkids. Parents need to check on their kids. We need to check on ourselves. And we need to make sure, like old Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Thank you for our time today. Lord, we move next week very rapidly to the creation of humanity. I pray that you'll help us. We love and thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand if you would, please. Our song of invitation.
just as I am. Men are here today. Ladies are here today. If you're here today without the Lord Jesus and you'd love to give your heart to Christ today, recognizing that in the beginning, God, we would love to take a Bible, show you how to be saved. Maybe you want to come today and pray for your family, pray for your children, pray for your grandchildren. Maybe you want to come today and just acknowledge the eternality of God, that you are not God yourself. You are created by God. And give him praise and glory as the great creator. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Verse number one, just as I am, you come as God leads you. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. I come just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul. Is that Tressie or Minnie? Tressie. I always get you coming forward for membership today to present yourself. It's prayer for your son. Yeah. It takes a lot of courage to walk forward and have prayer for your son. What's his name? Paul Wallace. Wallace. You heard that, right? Paul. We will pray for her son. Amen. You know, I send you out with some homework sometimes. Little example. When I was a little boy, I was not allowed to watch He-Man. Anybody remember He-Man? He-Man was the master of the... He would lift his sword, right? My dad would come in and he would say, there's one master of the universe. His name is Jesus Christ. I just want you to be uh, concentrated on the surrounding around you everywhere, how many times you hear somebody refer to themselves as a God, especially from the airwaves. God, 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 we're a God, we're a God, we're a God, we're a God. Just be aware of it. Tie it back to Genesis chapter one. Pray for Paul if you would please. Thank you so much for being here. Our song to go home is is, is page 34. It's a little chorus. It's on the screen. We, uh, We will sing this often at the end because it's a wonderful declaration. He is Lord. He is Lord. See you on Wednesday night. God bless you all. We're now dismissed for Sunday school.